Everyone underestimates me, but then they turn their back and I'm like, boo! <laughs> I drew the power of energy. Drawing at a
I always wanted a piece of artwork in my bathroom, so I decided to draw my cologne. Why? I have no idea. I just like how it smells. So I took the picture of it, started drawing it, and this part, the top, the cap of the cologne took forever. But I was finally able to get past it after like five days, and then I was able to get the rest of the part of the drawing done. And this is the final drawing. Email me a photo to be drawn. La Duca A, Buffalo Bull, a Grand Pawnee Warrior, is an artwork by George Catlin. The artwork depicts La Duca A, also known as Buffalo Bull, a Grand Pawnee Warrior. Buffalo Bull was described by George Catlin as a warrior of great distinction. In the portrait, Buffalo Bull appears with his totem, the head of a buffalo, painted on his chest and his face with a bow and arrow in his hands. This unfinished portrait provides a key to Catlin's working methods in the West, where he had to work quickly. George Catlin's work is known for its intimate and detailed portrayal of Native American life and culture in the 19th century. His paintings provide valuable insights into the lives and customs of various Native American tribes during this period.
to draw Donald Duck Part 2. Just go over your lines and make them darker. I shaded in the dark areas like the eyes and the hat. All done. The Lantern Bearers is a painting created by Maxfield Parrish in 1908. In this painting, six figures are dressed up as Pierrots, which are French pantomime comic characters. They are seen hanging up paper lanterns onto a tree, silhouetted against the sky. The figures are posed on marble steps in an almost theatrical manner. The lanterns seem to glow against the evening sky, still lighter along the horizon. Parrish applied layers of pure pigment and varnish to create a brilliant depth of color. The gold-hued lanterns glow against the blue night sky, creating a mesmerizing effect. This painting is a symbolic piece created in the symbolism style. Symbolism is an art movement where the artwork aims to represent absolute truths symbolically through metaphorical images and language. Thanks, Luke, for sending in a photo. Who's next?
Alpine Mastiffs, Reanimating a Distressed Traveller, is a powerful work painted by Sir Edwin Landseer in 1820, when he was only 18 years old. The painting depicts a rescue scene in the Great St. Bernard Pass in the Alps. In the painting, two dogs have found an unconscious man partially buried by snow. One dog is licking the unconscious traveller's hand to revive him, while the other is barking to summon monks who are seen approaching from the background. The monks, who had established a hospice in the pass, are rushing to the aid of the distressed traveller. The dogs in the painting are large and are the ancestors of the St. Bernards we know today. These dogs were bred by the Augustinian monks and were famous for finding and rescuing travellers. The painting highlights Landseer's skill and talent at such an early age. It displays not only his ability to create a dramatic and moving scene, but also his remarkable ability to depict animals with great realism and emotion. In the heart of the Dutch Golden Age, around 1665, a masterpiece was born from the hands of Johannes Vermeer, a painting that transcends time, the girl with a pearl earring. Not a portrait, but a trony. A trony is a type of 17th century painting focusing on an exaggerated or characterful face, often not meant to be a portrait of a specific individual. Her eyes, filled with a timeless mystery, are turned towards us. She is embellished with an oriental turban and a pearl earring, a pearl of such size it could only exist in a painter's dream. The signature Ivy Mir is there, but no date, adding to the enigma of the piece. The painting's home has been the Moritz Schuy in The Hague, Netherlands since 1902. Its restoration in 1994 revealed the subtle color scheme and the intimacy of the girl, further enhancing its allure. This painting is a shining star from the Dutch Golden Age, always capturing our hearts and imagination, all thanks to Vermeer's incredible talent. The girl with a pearl earring is a snapshot of eternity, held in paint and canvas, proving that some moments, once captured, live on forever. In 1900, Evelyn de Morgan brought to life an enchanting artwork known as the Storm Spirits. This masterpiece animates the stormy elements, rain, thunder and lightning, transforming them into mesmerizing female figures that dance amidst the chaos, stirring the sea into a frenzied turmoil below. On the painting's left, cloaked in a vibrant yellow, the rain spirit gracefully spills silvery streams from an eternal flask, while on the opposite side, the lightning spirit, with fiery red wings and swift-footed, casts bolts of electricity into the heart of the storm with a flick of her wrist. Dominating the scene from above is the thundercloud spirit, garbed in the deepest shades of blue, her shadowy wings and attire blending seamlessly with the brooding clouds that frame her. Yet, a serene haven emerges at the center. This tranquil spot, untouched by the surrounding mayhem, whispers promise of a peaceful respite and a hopeful glimpse into a better tomorrow. The painting was executed in the middle of the Boer War, and as such, it can be read as a symbolic depiction of the chaos of war and hope for a return to peace. Dante and Virgil is an oil-on-canvas painting created by the French academic painter William Adolphe Bouguereau in 1850. It is currently housed in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. The painting depicts a scene from Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, specifically from the Inferno section, which narrates a journey through hell by Dante and his guide Virgil. The scene is set in the eighth circle of hell, which is reserved for falsifiers and counterfeiters. In the painting, Dante and Virgil are seen watching a fight between two damned souls, Capoccio, a heretic and alchemist, and Gianni Schicci, who had usurped the identity of a dead man to fraudulently claim his inheritance. Gianni Schicci is depicted biting Capoccio on the neck. Bouguereau's painting is noted for its boldness and exploration of aesthetic boundaries. He exaggerates the muscle structure to the point of distortion, contrasts color and shadows, and depicts monstrous figures and groups of damned souls. The painting is filled with a sense of terribilita and horror. This painting was Bouguereau's third attempt to win the coveted Prix de Rome, but it was unsuccessful. However, he did succeed later in the year when his work, Shepherds Find Zenobia on the Banks of the Araxes, won the consolation second prize. The Lunatic of Etreta is an oil painting on canvas by Hugues Merle, a French painter known for his works in the academic tradition. 
The painting depicts a barefoot, unkempt female figure seated beside a well. She clutches a log as if it were a baby. Her knuckles, feet, and veins protrude, indicating her distress. Her intense contortion suggests a readiness to flee. Dressed in tattered clothing with hair flowing wild across her shoulders, she appears disheveled. The woman's gaze is a compelling element of this painting. The visible sclera of her eyes embodies a Japanese phenomenon known as sanpaku, or three whites which is believed to represent imbalance and imply a dangerous future. This, coupled with the woman's aggressive body language, contributes to a reading of the painting as one of anguish. The painting is often interpreted as emblematic of female rage, madness, or mourning child loss. However, it was completed in 1871, the same year that France lost the Franco-Prussian War. This context offers an alternative analysis of the work, suggesting that the woman could be considered the personification of France. The lunatic of Etretat is a departure from Merle's typical realist style and is better described as belonging to the Romanticism movement. The painting's emotional intensity and dynamism set it apart from his other works. Has everyone here encountered this masterpiece by Grant Wood, though familiar to our eyes, but what it is all about? The painting portrays a farmer and a woman, often mistakenly assumed to be his wife, but is actually his daughter. The farmer is holding a pitchfork, and both are standing in front of a house built in the Carpenter Gothic architectural style. The house, located in Eldon, Iowa, caught Wood's attention due to its distinctive Gothic window. The farmer is dressed in overalls covered by a suit jacket, while the woman is adorned in a colonial print apron, evoking 20th century rural Americana. The painting is rich in visual puns and echoes, for example between the pitchfork and the bib of the farmer's overalls, and the pinnacle on the house visually repeating the church spire in the far distance. Wood was inspired to paint what he fancied as the kind of people who should live in that house. He used his sister, Nan, and his dentist, Dr. Byron McKeeby, as models for the couple. Each posed separately for Wood as he made his painting. Wood was a member of the regionalist movement in American art, which championed the solid rural values of Central America against the complexities of European-influenced East Coast modernism. His style in this painting reflects the precise realism of 15th century Northern European artists. The painting has been subject to various interpretations over the years. Some view it as a depiction of the steadfast American pioneer spirit, while others see it as a satire of rural small-town life. Regardless, American Gothic remains one of the most iconic images in 20th century American art. In the haunting depths of a moon-drenched wasteland, Francisco Goya's masterpiece, Witch's Sabbath, El Aquelare, emerges as a chilling oil on canvas revelation. This Spanish maestro conjures a nightmarish tableau where the devil, masquerading as a goat festooned with garlands, presides over a ghastly gathering. Enthroned amidst a grotesque assembly of witches, both decrepit elders and deceptive youths, he brandishes grand horns and wears a crown of oak, a sinister monarch of the occult. A grim spectacle unfolds as an ancient witch cradles a withered infant, offering to their infernal deity. This devil, in a blasphemous parody of a priest, seems to initiate the child into their dark rites, feeding on the innocence of youth, as law once whispered, devouring the flesh of the unborn and the newly born alike. The skeletal remains of two infants, one carelessly discarded and the other clutched by a haggard crone, serve as a morbid testament to their malevolent feast. Goya masterfully inverts sacred symbols to serve the profane. The goat devil extends his left hoof in a perverse welcome to the child under the watchful gaze of an inverted quarter moon, a celestial body turned away in silent protest. Above, a conspiracy of bats weaves through the air, their chaotic dance mirroring the crescent's curve, harbingers of doom under the spell of the unholy congregation. This tableau of terror and beauty, Witch's Sabbath, resides within the solemn walls of the Museo Lazaro Galdiano, Madrid, a sentinel guarding Goya's dark vision from the annals of the Spanish Golden Age to the eyes of the modern beholder. Within the vast Catholic law, the seven corporal acts of mercy cater to the physical necessities of the less fortunate. These are feeding the hungry, visiting the imprisoned, burying the dead, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, giving shelter to travelers, and offering drink to the thirsty. Within a single masterpiece, Caravaggio encapsulates all seven virtues, feeding the hungry and visiting the imprisoned. Within this compelling detail, Caravaggio portrays Pero, 
a figure from Roman legend symbolizing charity, as she nourishes her imprisoned father, illustrating both feeding the hungry and visiting the imprisoned. Burying the dead. A glance to the left reveals a scene dedicated to burying the dead. A priest, adorned in a white tunic and holding a torch, observes as two figures carry away a body, its feet disappearing behind a wall, indicating its final journey. Clothing the naked and caring for the sick. Moving further left, we observe Saint Martin, elegantly attired with a feathered cap, dividing his cloak to cover a naked and ailing man on the ground, representing clothing the naked and caring for the sick. A closer look reveals the gleam of Saint Martin's sword just above the shoulder of the beggar. Adjacent to Saint Martin, a pair engages in conversation. An innkeeper gestures towards shelter, while a pilgrim, identified by his hat's emblem and staff, signifies agreement. Offering drink to the thirsty, Caravaggio pays homage to the act of offering drink to the thirsty through the narrative of Samson, a warrior of the Old Testament revitalized by water from a donkey's jawbone, depicted with white paint strokes representing the essence of flowing water. Overseeing the entire scene are the Madonna and Child, supported by two winged angels. Mary's gaze lovingly approves the merciful actions below. Illuminated by divine light, the joy on Jesus' face reflects his satisfaction, which will come to completion with his future sacrifice on the cross. The angels, locked in an embrace, float effortlessly, detailed with lifelike detail by Caravaggio. With a gesture bridging the celestial and earthly realms, the angel to the left extends his right arm downwards, bestowing divine illumination upon the scene, inspiring the figures below to carry out the works of mercy. Caravaggio's seven acts of mercy captures the essence of compassion, where the acts of giving, caring and sharing are immortalized. It's a reminder that during life's darkest moments there's always a light of kindness, ready to shine through.